Hi, I'm Gillian Russell and this is the Personal Best Podcast, a download from the BBC. For more information, just head to our website, bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio Scotland. Do you manage to fit any exercise into your working day? Or is it hard to even get out for a walk at lunchtime? Um, I think it's tied to the desk and that's it really. As soon as you you get into work, in fact our boss is a little bit worried about us going out for the full lunch hour and things like that. So it's not something that's actively encouraged, no. Well, if that sounds familiar, and hey, I present a radio programme at lunchtime, so I can't get out for a walk. Well, we're going to be finding out how being active can actually increase your productivity at work. I'm Gillian Russell, so if you're aiming for your personal best, then don't disappear. Now, is stress making you ill? What actually gets you stressed? You can text us on 82295 or tweet at BBC Radio Scott. Well, over 100 million days are lost to stress each year, costing UK employers over a billion pounds. And that's not to mention the personal cost to us as individuals. Now, April is Stress Awareness Month, which is all about highlighting the causes and cures for our stress epidemic. Well, in a moment, I'll be speaking to Neil Shah from the Stress Management Society. But first, we asked you to get in touch with your experiences of stress. Here's Michael on what stresses him. Stress is something that I deal with on an ongoing basis. And there's many triggers for me, but... Probably the thing that causes me the most stress is uh, financial issues. Um, It affects my whole life. Um, It affects my sleep patterns. It affects my weight loss. It affects my relationships. I'm not very nice to people. Not very nice to myself. It just makes everything, everything difficult. Makes me a very negative person. When I get like that, it can be quite scary as well. Just feel like everything's closing in on me and and nothing can be done about it it's just a horrible horrible feeling Um, I'm learning as I go along to deal with it a bit better and finding some strategies that help me Um, but it's definitely something that I'll probably always find a bit difficult and uh, has a has a real impact on my life Well, Neil Shah is with me. Neil, you have a great job title, Chief De-Stressing Officer. I think I want your job. (laughs) Um, You've also written the 10-step stress solution. How do we go about identifying stress as opposed to, say, just being a bit busy? That's a great question because people often approach our organisation, they're looking for the answers to stress. The answers is, for me, actually the easy bit. The recognition is so important because most people don't take action until it's way too late. Most of us can very easily associate with the feelings or the emotions of stress. I feel stressed, I feel anxious, I feel overwhelmed, I feel panicky, can't think clearly. But actually stress in and of itself isn't a feeling. It's it's a physical response. Your body's gone into that fight or flight state in preparation to to deal with that saber tooth tiger that's attacking it. So, you know, being aware of the the physiological changes, the heart pounding, the breathing becoming shallow and fast, the muscles tensing up, um, you know, the body temperature increasing, need to go to the toilet. You know, if you can pick it up at the physio, when the physical changes occur, you can take appropriate actions to prevent it from ever getting anywhere near that point where it's going to start to have an impact on how you feel. And presumably those those sort of milder symptoms that you described there, um, can, can to that extent, can stress be um, a positive thing when it's in a, on small scale? And, and it, that's, interestingly, a lot of people think that stress is a good thing or a bad thing. Some people even say good stress and bad stress, which I think is quite misleading. There's only one stress response. There's different severities of that response, and it could be appropriate depending on what you're doing. Let's say, for example, you're about to hunt, run a 100-meter sprint. Uh, and Gillian, from what I understand, you're a little bit of a triathlete yourself. So oh, I've, I've been known to do the odd <laughs> one or two minor triathlons, yes. Uh, fantastic. So if you imagine that you're about to start a run, and let's say it's, it's a short-distance sprint triathlon, so you're only running, so let's say, um, you, you know, a, 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 a thousand meters for example well, let's say you're running even a shorter race you're running a hundred meter sprint i'm sure you can appreciate when someone's about to start a sprint they're in a tight tense state they're pumped up looks of determination on their faces muscles bulging 
essentially they're only running for, 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 for 100 metres, so they're putting themselves into a high degree of stress because that helps to drive the best sports performance. Now, you know, if you're running a sprint, absolutely fine to be highly, highly stressed. But if you want to run a marathon, a long distance race, actually operating from a state of stress is going to make it very difficult to do so uh, because you're going to exhaust yourself. You're going to burn yourself out very, very quickly. And that's the key thing that I'm going to ask people to consider is that, you, you know, that if you've got some kind of an emergency or an accident, yes, being in a high degree of stress is absolutely appropriate. But if you are looking to, to, to do something where you need to think clearly and you need to be able to pace yourself, operating from a state stress is probably going to be counterproductive I'd like you to consider stress as um, a spectrum from 0 to 100 at 100 we hit burnout we're, we're so stressed we literally shut down at zero, we are bored, sluggish, lethargic. We have no energy, motivation to get anything done. I would describe that as a rust out. There's a space between those two zones that I would describe as the performance zone, where you're mentally, physically, emotionally best equipped to perform at the very best of your ability. It's different for different people and different activities, but I'm going to encourage everyone to consider what is your performance zone, where your stress levels are optimized to the point where you can function at your very best. Okay, well, I'm, I mean, I'm kind of thinking back to, to Michael and what he had said there about how stress gets to him in terms of his daily life. I mean, is he showing clear stress symptoms? The, the kind of things he was suggesting gives me the impression that he's operating outside of that performance zone and edging towards burnout. Now, he hasn't quite hit it yet because he's still functional. He's still able to have a conversation with us. When you hit burnout, you will literally shut down. That's where people may end up having a breakdown, for example, or other serious uh, sort of issues. So when you are operating above that zone of performance, you're going to start to experience the kind of symptoms that Michael described. Now, sadly, we live in a society where most people are operating in that state. You know, if we think of specific examples in in Scotland, for you know, I was reading a report about uh, police officers that you know, you know some, something like 35% of police officers have taken time off in the last five years in Scotland for psychological reasons, and a third of them are planning to leave the workforce because they feel they're under undue stress. Essentially, they're being put in a zone which is performing, uh, sorry, forcing them to perform outside of a space which is sustainable and these are just some examples and you know obviously across the UK we're seeing more and more of this that people are being pushed to to, to work in and, and live in a way that is not sustainable. Well I'm wondering you know you talked about some of the, the symptoms the milder ones and the more severe ones but I mean how dangerous can stress be if it's not dealt with? Ultimately it can kill you. Now stress in and of itself can't kill you but it definitely contributes very heavily to things that will. For example, heart disease, the number one reason for, for, for death, uh, for, sorry, number one reason for premature death on the planet is heart disease. Uh, then we've got things like cancer, type 2 diabetes, stroke, which are often quoted as the top four reasons for human beings to die prematurely uh, on the planet. Stress is a significant contributing factor to all four of those conditions. You know, in terms of heart disease, it's one of the primary contributing factors. Many forms of cancer have been linked back to stress. Type two diabetes is a lifestyle, sorry, a lifestyle related illness. Now, when you're stressed, that has an impact on sleep patterns. It has an impact on the kind of foods that you consume. It has an impact on, you know, so many different aspects of your life. And you know, it becomes the trigger that leads you on a path that potentially then can lead to the kind of illnesses that we're talking about. Uh, we talked about people having uh, burnout, breakdowns, and mental emotional breakdowns. So again, mental health is becoming a, a, a very, very, very severe issue in modern society. Um, but sadly, something that also we've seen a significant increase in since the turn of the century is, is, is people taking their own lives. Um, and again, if you have significant amounts of stress and pressure in your life, there are people that are going to get to the point where they will seek the ultimate permanent solution to a temporary problem, very sadly. And I'll give you a perfect example of a straw breaking the camel's back. If we remember the nurse in the, the Kate Middleton story, you know, when the princess was pregnant with Prince George and the, uh, the, 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 the nurse received a prank phone call from the radio presenter in Australia, uh, which she inadvertently put through, the, the ultimate outcome of that scenario was she took her own life, very sadly. But when the subsequent investigation took place, they determined that on her on her plate, she had a relationship breakup. She had some financial challenges. She was a single parent. There was all of this stuff going on in her life. That issue at work was the straw that broke the camel's back. And that's what, what stress can often lead to. Exactly. Um, well, I want to, to um, hear from another personal best listener. Here's, uh, here's Deborah and her experiences of stress. 
I get stressed out in conflict situations and this includes anything very, very minor. Um, it is impacting my life. It's also impacting my relationships quite substantially and means that I actually can no longer stand up for myself no matter what the situation is. Um, and that includes even when I know deep down that I'm right or that the situation that I've been put in is not right for me. Uh, this has been going on for quite a while, um, but is relatively new in terms of I used to be able to stand up for myself when I was younger. This is something that I'm working through and trying to address. Um, it is a slow process, but it is a process and I do feel um, as if I am getting stronger each day. Well, Neil, it's interesting there um, what Deb is talking about. I, I wonder how much of this is about managing stress once you are stressed or how much of it is about identifying the cause and trying to change that before you get too far down the line? I think there's a bit of both, but there's something else that we probably should mention at this stage. Whether it's something that's actually stressful happening or it's your perception that what's happening is stressful, it has the same impact. I'll give you an example. We've done programs with the Ministry of Defence and soldiers returning from places like Afghanistan and obviously may have experienced something quite traumatic, which would have caused at the time a significant issue of stress, which potentially could lead to post-traumatic stress syndrome. When we're working with them in the UK, there are thousands of miles from the nearest war zone, yet even just thinking about reflecting and uh, kind of talking about their experience in the theatre of war will create an experience of stress which would have been exactly the same as if they were actually in the war zone. From a mental, physical and emotional perspective, they've gone into a high state of stress just by thinking about it. The subconscious mind cannot differentiate between what is real and what is perceived. If you are sat there, thinking about things that you perceive to be stressful and creating this kind of experience of stress in your subconscious, your body will physically react as if it's actually experiencing it. Because most stress happens in the future or in the past. We're stressing about something that's likely to happen or something that has happened previously. Most stress isn't really happening right now in the sense that stress happening right now is I'm being attacked by a saber-toothed tiger. Most people, that's not really what's happening. So if we can understand that, and put ourselves back into the moment and recognize actually what are the triggers that are happening right here, right now that I can take action against, that's when you're empowered to do something about it. Because you know, if there's something stressful happening in front of you, you could go outside and take a break, go for a walk. The kind of things that you mentioned earlier in the day about you know people taking more 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 opportunities to, to, to remove themselves from the environments that are causing stress. If it's happening in your mind, then maybe take yourself somewhere else in your mind or do something else to to to, to separate yourself from the things that are triggering that reaction. Mm, that's interesting. Well, um, here's a, a, another um, listener. Joanne emailed us to say that she gets stressed trying to get her kids up and out the door in the morning. I think a lot of us can probably relate to that. But she says it's not just school days. It happens when they have even something fun planned. She says she ends up shouting at them. It's a mad dash to get sorted and out the door. She says she'd love to avoid this kind of stress every day, but just doesn't know what to do. Neil, what kind of advice would you give to Joanne and, and other parents in terms of dealing with that kind of stress? Now, uh, Joanne may not appreciate the advice I'm about to give her, but she has created that stress. Um, the, uh, in, in the sense that we have ultimate power over how we react and respond to the things that are happening in front of us. We might not be able to change what's happening, but we have absolute power to change how we react and respond to that. Now, she has chosen to view that as a stressful situation and has reacted in a way that's potentially likely to further enable that behavior for her children. There's a model in psychology known as transactional analysis where essentially we're looking at three different ego states, parent, adult, and child. Now, this is nothing to do with the age of the individual. It's more the space that they're coming from. If you are, are my daughter, for example, and I want to kind of, uh, yeah, I, I want you to, to hurry up and get ready. And I'm screaming, oh, just bloody hurry up and get yourself ready and we need to get out. Like I'm operating as this kind of angry, critical parent. What's going to happen to your behavior if I'm talking to you in that way? I'm going to rise up and probably make it worse. And absolutely, and that's the thing. Is a lot of people don't appreciate that when you are approaching a, a situation in a particular way, and this, this works with people of the same age in the workplace, for example, we teach as a management technique. If you are treating people like children and scolding them and berating them for problem behavior, they go into that child state. They go into that kind of either, you, you know, kind of very submissive and, 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 and very react, reactionary or very emotional, or they could be just ignoring you and not paying attention and going kind of that, that teenage phase kind of thing. So ultimately, it's we'll focus on the fact. 
what I would say to uh, suggest for Joanna is in a situation like that, you know, approaching the children and say, look, this is what needs to be done. Here are the conse consequences of not doing it. Just put the facts on the table and have a fact-based adult-to-adult conversation. Now, in fact, a lot of the progressive parenting styles suggest not talking to even small children like children, but talk to them like adults and have uh, kind of that relationship where we are saying, here's what we're doing, here's the consequences of not doing it, and here's the rewards for doing it. And actually, that is a much better way to develop a child's ability to, to, to differentiate between what's right and what's wrong and also putting less stress back on you because you're putting the responsibility on them you're asking them to step up and make decisions that will serve them in an appropriate way mm, good point i'm going to pop that in my pocket as well um, do stay with us neil coming up on the program i'm going to be talking to the man who has a completely unique location for his daily run you won't believe where he runs at the moment you're listening to personal best with me Gillian russell if you've just joined us don't forget you can catch up on the iplayer or download our free podcast just go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio scotland now we hear a lot on this program about exercise being good for our physical and mental well-being but there's increasing evidence that it can have a positive impact on our work successes too just something that uh, you were touching on there neil well victoria joy is a health and wellness journalist who's been looking at this research victoria i mean how much can exercise actually boost your career or your productivity at work Sure. Um, well, as you said, there's a, there's a growing mass of research looking into the links between fitness, kind of keeping keeping fit with regular exercise and the workplace. And it, you'd be surprised at how much hard science there is to back this up. So we th there's been research, so particularly by Leeds Metropolitan University, um, uh, a guy there called Jim McKenna, who's looked at, at white collar workers at, at their desks on days that they chose to exercise exercise on site so we're talking at lunchtime and days where they did no exercise and and they actually found that workday exercise both improved the mood which is not particularly surprising but also the the performance of those workers actually to the extent that on the days that they exercised that percentage increase in performance was comparable to them achieving in seven hours what they'd otherwise achieve in eight so That's so amazing. from that point of view they've you know they've taken the hour at lunch to go and work out but in terms of the productivity over the course of the day they they've lost nothing in terms of you know their their boss and their company has still got that full day of of really great work out out of those people that's quite incredible because there is that perception of you know being stuck at your desk and thinking i haven't got time to get away um, and it's almost like changing our mindset to to realize that the getting away will be beneficial Absolutely. And I think what was particularly interesting about that study was that the, the research team looked at the same individuals. So they didn't compare really fit, healthy, active individuals to those individuals who never exercised and, and kind of, you know, felt lethargic. These were the same people who on some days exercised, on some days didn't, and they still found this this massive increase in productivity. So it, it, we are talking about, you know, on, on Monday, not exercising, on Tuesday, going out and, and doing some exercise on your lunch break and, and seeing that difference day to day in what you're, what you're achieving personally personally and also what you're giving back to a company well I mean we all have different issues at work and different worries and different stresses so what kind of exercise will benefit each type of work issue because presumably depending on what's going on in in the workplace um, there may be some things that are more suited to you personally or to what your, your workplace issue is Absolutely. I, I think you hit the nail on, on the head when you said suited to you personally, because I I think we can look at specific studies, looking at specific exercise. But at the end of the day, it's finding what, what works for you and what is going to to give you the motivation to actually work out I mean there are there are different studies um to look into to the benefits of different exercise um high intensity interval training has been shown to have a very profound effect on the brain so in terms of um cognition and and brain structure and function uh, so the the argument is that that is kind of you know boosting your brain power you're you're going to have improved memory you're going to improve creatively um yeah. 
I, I then, need to do that right now. <laughs> and and then we've got yoga, who which has been proven time and again to to kind of um, have a really great de-stressing effect on on the body and the mind. But I also that, need to do that. <laughs> that said. If an individual doesn't particularly like either of those exercises, they're probably not going to do them and it's going to fall by the wayside. And after a couple of days, however well-intentioned they are, then they're not going to be keeping fit and they're not going to be keeping you know, that, that exercise schedule up regularly. So I think even more importantly is to find something that you really like, that you can do regularly. We're, t- we're talking about, you know three to four times a week maybe half an hour at a time ideally a lot of the studies will show consistent aerobic exercise so actually we're talking 30 minutes of exercise every day but you know in in this day and age I'd, I completely understand that isn't a realistic target for everybody um but but yeah as I said it, it's not necessarily focusing on one specific exercise we can't necessarily say cycling is the best to to boost your brain power what you'll often find is that if a research team have have shown that link they chose cycling as an example of exercise and and they then found that there was a link between that and you know boosted brain power that's not necessarily to say that cycling is any better than any other exercise because where you know whatever you're doing you're increasing your heart rate you're getting that blood pumping around your body so so the result is the same Mm. I'd say what's most important is to find something that works for you and also works into your schedule I'm just gonna can I just add something that yeah just quickly there's a word that I would change from exercise to physical activity exercise is like diet the moment you mention diet people will have kind of a a a connotation of what that means physical activity could be walking up the stairs it could be you know the the stretching the 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 moment you introduce the word exercise people may have fears associated with that changing to activity makes it a little bit more accessible Mm, good point well i mean neil do you encourage your team to get out and exercise during the working day Yes, and we're just about to move into new offices literally over the next couple of weeks, and that's been my biggest stress. And one of the first things that we're having done is having a shower installed so people can cycle to work. We have our office by the Grand Union Canal in West London, so people can go for runs at lunchtime, and we're actively encouraging that. Uh, one of the big changes, which I haven't announced to my team yet, so I'm announcing it to the whole of Scotland before my team hear about it, is we're going to make a change to the working day. So you get your eight hours done. If you want to take a two-hour lunch break, which involves an hour work, uh, an hour's sort of running, have a shower, have some lunch you know um, use the meditation room which we're also installing in our new office then you can do that so you're flexible about your work pattern so you can get to do all the wonderful things that the the environment will afford well i love the sound of that but uh, if you're listening to this and thinking well it's all very well but my job doesn't allow for exercise during the day you're probably not alone i worked in a children's home residential care for children Right, so how practical would that have been for you just to say, do you know what, this is getting too much, I'm just going to take half an hour out? It's not practical at all. Because there are two people on shift looking after four children and you're there for a 24-hour shift and you just couldn't you just couldn't leave them. You weren't even allowed to have your lunch. Did that have an impact on your health? Yes. In what way? Ate more, drank more, <laughs> got more stressed. I've never been so healthy since I left there. It would be so handy if you get out for half an hour just to just get a break, just to free your mind a wee bit. I mean, our our company is looking at getting a, a gym membership, but you would need to take time out your own time to do it before you came to work. Um, I think it's tied to the desk, and that's it really. As soon as you you get into work, in fact, our boss is a little bit worried about us going out for the full lunch hour and things like that. So it's not something that's actively encouraged. No. We have quite a short lunch times, so it would be possible, but then we maybe wouldn't have a chance to eat anything. (laughs) But we're a small, very small retail unit, so we need the staff to be there. You know, we're a tight team. So it's really not practical. It's not practical. But because they're part-time, then they do have plenty of time. I am the boss for where I work, (laughs) and I do a lot of exercise, a very kind of on-your-feet type job. So, yeah, I'm always buzzing about the, the hotel and things I work in. Okay, so what about your employees? They said, I'm feeling a bit stressed, I need to go out for a run. Would you allow them to go out for a half hour run? I think it's important that people find the right kind of kind of balance between their kind of mental health and their, their kind of physical health as well. So yeah, we all, I always completely encourage staff to get as much exercise as they possibly can, you know, and like you say, if they're a bit stressed, a bit pent up, just give them five minutes, just go and blow off some steam. If you're recruiting somebody and they did no exercise or weren't active, 
would that kind of put you off employing them? I think it probably would. I think I think you need people who are going to look after themselves personally as much as they would do professionally, you know, and it's it can impact on both parts of their life. So certainly, yeah, from my point of view, it probably would do. Whether that's HR's answer is a whole different score. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Well, Victoria, I mean, how much are employers recognising the benefits of, of exercise on productivity in the workplace? I think it's a, a growing cultural change. I think we're seeing more and more businesses uh, recognise the importance of their employee well-being. So when they have employees in in their workplaces already, they they feel like they have a certain responsibility uh, to those employees. Um, but I think what having spoken to to recruiters in the past around this topic, I think we're also seeing um, not necessarily a bias to to people who um, engage in physical activity a lot, but but there is certainly a sense, um, especially in kind of higher management and executive positions, where if a recruiter was faced with say two CVs, where on on the face of it they're very very similar, they've got the same experience, they've they've got the same qualifications if one of those candidates has you know run five London marathons and trains for Tough Mudder every year and and uh, goes to yoga three times a week it what we're talking about is they're just showing it's it's another way to demonstrate the evidence that says you have all of these skills associated with the workplace and and you're putting them into play in your personal life well, it's interesting because that that was kind of alluded to there in the in the tape. But I wonder to what extent there's a risk of discrimination if a person isn't active. Sure. I mean, I, d- I don't think we're anywhere near that yet. I d- and I don't necessarily think it's a conscious thing. Um, so there's a term in recruitment called the like me bias. So it will be where whether consciously or not, um, a a manager or a recruiter will maybe. Um, go for candidates that share similar interests or have similar backgrounds to them so it might be and what's interesting was was in your vox pops that hotel manager saying that he he takes an interest in physical activity himself so he was more than happy to to have employees that do so and also he'd look for those uh, kind of qualities in potential employees i don't think we're talking about discrimination i think we're we're talking about a a bigger cultural shift towards the fact that if you if you do exercise regularly you are you know you're going to be your best self you're going to be fitter in body and mind and from a recruiter's point of view or an employee's point of view who wouldn't want those kind of people coming into their business or their company yeah good good point yes and we're just about out of time neil how best can we go trying to incorporate exercise into work? And I think just to, to, to add in, this isn't just about productivity and efficiency. It's not about you know happiness or just about creating a happy, healthy workforce. This is a risk management issue. You, you know, uh, stressed out staff. Yes, it can lead to, to to lower productivity and efficiency, but it can also lead to accidents, injuries, and sadly even death. You know, a perfect example: Nine Wells, a Nine Wells Hospital in Dundee. So where... Neil, we're, we're going to have to leave it there. We are right out of time. There's lots more we can discuss on this. We will come back to it another week. And I did promise we were going to talk to the man that runs in the most unusual location. We will have him on air next week. Until then, Janice is up next. Bye for now.